Welcome to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. Each week, we feature an episode from the best independent creators. Hit subscribe for more great true crime content. If you would like to support Indie Drop-In and get these episodes ad-free, check out our Patreon at the bottom of the show notes. Today's episode is from Dark Dark World. Don't forget to check out the show notes for links to subscribe and follow on social media. Enjoy the show. Begin. Dark Dark World contains strong language and depictions of sex, violence, and sexual violence. Please use discretion when listening to our episodes. Tempe, Arizona, Saturday, June 15th, sometime shortly after 3 a.m. On the street outside of her apartment, where she and her roommates were throwing a party, 19-year-old Adrian Salinas climbed into her white mercury sable. She sat quietly for a moment, thinking about the latest argument she'd had with Francisco and debating whether or not she should go over to his house. Maybe she should just stay home. It was about a 20-minute drive to Fran's house, and she had been drinking. She didn't want to stay at her party, though. It was loud and obnoxious and showed no signs of slowing. There must have been 40 people inside. Even from inside her car on the street, she could hear the ruckus. Adrian turned over the ignition. She needed to fix things with Fran. She pulled away from the curb and headed down the road. Not five minutes into her drive, Adrian noticed she was swerving. She tried to focus, closing one eye in an effort to reduce the drifting in her vision. Still driving through a residential area, she came to a curb in the road. As she came around the corner, Adrian hit the curb, causing her to momentarily lose control of her vehicle. She overcompensated as she tried to turn the steering wheel back toward the curb, which caused her to hit the curb a second time and blow out both of the driver's side tires. Adrian came to a stop and put the car in park. She hopped out to assess the damage to her trusty sable, which adorned a favorite local bumper sticker that read, I love Pete's fish and chips. Adrian sighed. She knew she wouldn't be driving anymore that night, so she locked up her car and headed back to her apartment on foot. When Adrian returned to the party, her roommates, Shaney and Rebecca, were surprised to see her. Shaney asked Adrian why she was back so soon. Adrian told the girls that she had simply forgotten to bring a change of clothes with her and had returned to pack a bag. She quietly snuck through the small ocean of partygoers to get back to her bedroom, where she packed a few belongings in an overnight bag. She took out her cell phone and looked for a cab company. She found one called Scottsdale Cab Guy and called them up to arrange a ride from the AMPM down the street from her apartment. It was now 4.43 a.m., and she texted Francisco to let him know she was coming over. Adrian grabbed her overnight bag, walked back out through the party, and said goodbye to her roommates. She stepped outside and began the quarter-mile walk to the a.m. p.m. It was the last time Shaney and Rebecca would ever see her. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Jordan Crittenden here. Welcome to another episode of Dark Dark World. Today's story comes to us from just seven years ago and from right here in my backyard in Arizona in a college town called Tempe, where Arizona State University is located. Uh, This case is a bit different from the ones that I usually cover on Dark Dark World in that it's still unsolved. The investigation is ongoing. And in fact, it it can't technically be referred to as a murder investigation at this point. The proper categorization is a suspicious death. So there's a lot of mystery involved with this story. And without further ado, uh, let's get right into it. I'm going to fill you in and unpack the mystery for you. This is Dark Dark World, Episode 21, The Suspicious Death of Adrian Salinas. 
At just 19 years old, Adrienne Salinas was a radiant young woman. Nearly every photo ever taken of her showcases her beautiful smile. Her friends and family say that her external beauty was a direct reflection of her heart. Out of all the interviews that friends and family would give about Adrienne, the worst thing that anyone had to say about her was that she had a tendency to lose her phone too frequently. A student at Gateway Community College, Adrienne was down to earth and easy to talk to, soft-spoken and a good listener. She kept a small core group of just a handful of friends who had all known each other since their high school days at Arcadia High. Among these friends was Adrian's on-again, off-again boyfriend and the love of her life, Francisco Artiaga, whose friends and Adrian called Fran. Adrian was kind, loyal, and loving. She put family first and was very close with her father. She was reliable. So when her father, Rick Salinas, hadn't seen nor heard from his daughter on Sunday, June 16th, 2013, he began to worry. He had spoken to her two nights earlier, late on Friday when she and Shaney and Rebecca were throwing a party at their apartment. But then all of Saturday had passed, and now, most of Sunday, Father's Day, had passed too. Adrian's phone appeared to be turned off, sending Rick's calls straight to voicemail and not returning his texts. Rick called Shaney and Rebecca and learned that they too were trying to reach Adrian and hadn't seen her since the early morning hours on Saturday. Adrian's boyfriend, Francisco, called Rick. He, too, was looking for Adrian. This was all very unusual for Adrian, Father's Day or not. So Rick Salinas called the police. It's just not like her. She would have called. She's not answering her texts, uh, the phone, and she still goes to her voicemail. You know, my thoughts are, are scattered. It's more of physical pain now, uh, the, the torture, the living hell that I'm going through right now because of not knowing and then the possibilities of her being in a harmful situation flashed through my mind. Despite Rick telling the police that Adrian wouldn't just disappear like this, it was technically too early for Adrian to be considered a missing person. So Rick and Fran began to drive around looking for Adrian. It was at this time that Fran told Rick that he had been asleep early Saturday morning when Adrian had decided to leave her party to come to his house. He woke up later that morning to find 11 missed calls from Adrian and a text that said, I'm coming over. When Fran finally called Adrian, her phone was off, sending his calls straight to voicemail. Eventually, Rick and Fran found Adrian's car, disabled with two blown tires, and parked a few blocks from her apartment. Rick and Fran contacted the Tempe Police Department again and demanded assistance. Yeah, it's just my whole world turned upside down, and I'm not knowing where my baby girl's at, you know. A missing persons report was filed and the search for Adrian Salinas began. Over the next few weeks, the search for Adrian Salinas widened. Tempe Police Detective Alan Akey was assigned to the case as lead investigator. Maybe there's somebody that was attending the party that took an interest in an intoxicated female. You know how that, you know, that dynamic works. And there's the possibility that it escalated and got out of control. In the early weeks of the investigation into Adrian's disappearance, Detective Akey and the Tempe Police Department learned that on the morning she went missing, Adrian had called for a cab ride from a local taxi company called Scottsdale Cab Guy. Tom Simon Sr., the owner of Scottsdale Cab Guy, received an initial call from Adrian sometime between 4.30 a.m. and 4.45 a.m. on Saturday, June 15th. He dispatched his son, Tom Simon Jr., to pick Adrian up in Tempe, where she had requested to meet at the a.m. p.m. on the corner of University Drive and Hardy Drive. A.m. p.m. is a gas station convenience store here in the States. When Tom Simon Jr. arrived at the a.m. p.m. on University and Hardy, Adrian had not yet arrived. Simon Jr. stepped out of his cab to have a smoke and called Adrian from his cell. It was 4.53 a.m. and Adrian answered the call, telling Tom Simon Jr. that she was walking up the street and was nearly there. However, Adrian never showed. At 5.07 a.m., Tom Simon Jr. tried Adrian's phone again, but now it went straight to voicemail. Simon Jr. got back into his cab and drove away. After 5.07 a.m. on Saturday, June 15th, 2013, no one would be able to reach Adrian Salinas on her cell phone ever again, making Tom Simon Jr. the last known person to have spoken to Adrian. If somebody did see something, somebody knows something, just to please come forward with any information so they can just put the, the pieces together and, 
and figure out what is actually taking place. In the late summer, most often in the month of August, the Arizona desert is hit by severe monsoons. A North American monsoon is a pattern of pronounced increases in thunderstorms and rainfall over large areas of the southwestern United States. Basically, they're just gnarly thunderstorms that we get out here almost daily in August. And oftentimes, monsoons will cause flooding, usually what we refer to as flash floods out here. On August 6, 2013, roughly six weeks after Adrian Salinas went missing, monsoons caused massive flooding in the Apache Junction area of Pinal County in Arizona about a 30-minute drive from Adrian's neighborhood in Tempe. After the flooding, when the water eventually receded from the Superstition Mountains, the mummified partial remains of a human corpse were discovered. Breaking news now. A body discovered in Apache Junction. Tempe police are there. We have Sky 12 over the scene. Three days later, on August 9, 2013, an autopsy was conducted. I'm going to read an excerpt from the medical examiner's notes. Quote, The remains are mostly skeletonized with mummified skin and muscle present more on the right side of the body as compared to the left side of the body. Some head hair is present on the upper neck. Pink nail polish is present on the toenails, end quote. Now, I say that was an excerpt, but actually that's pretty much the entirety of the examination notes, apart from one sentence that has been redacted. We'll come back to that, though. Scarring was discovered by taking radiographic images of the thorax. The bone scars that were discovered were consistent with scars that Adrian Salinas had developed when she had lung surgery after contracting valley fever. Valley fever is a lung infection caused by a fungus that grows in the soil in various parts of the southwestern United States. Sometimes it can get better on its own, but sometimes it can be devastating for people for animals. Obviously, Adrian had a serious case because it required surgery. Eventually, a DNA test confirmed Rick Salinas's worst fears when it revealed that the corpse in question was indeed his daughter, Adrian Salinas. No cause nor manner of death could be determined. A location of death could not be determined. It was impossible even to determine whether Adrian had been dead for just a couple of days or for the entire time she had been missing. All that Adrian's family and friends and the Tempe Police Department knew was that Adrian Salinas had vanished for nearly two months, and when she finally turned up, she turned up dead. Because Adrian's cause of death could not be determined, it could also not be determined whether her death was an accident or whether it might have been a suicide or homicide. However, given Adrian's character and typical behavior, those that knew and loved her were confident that accidents and suicide could be ruled out. Adrian's loved ones were convinced that she was murdered. Now, let's see if we can break down the timeline and the chain of events on the morning of Saturday, June 15th, 2013, from the time when Adrian Salinas returned to her apartment to pack a bag after wrecking her car to the time when she went missing. We know that Adrian's boyfriend, Fran, received 11 missed calls from Adrian between 4.15 a.m. and 4.43 a.m. At 4.43 a.m., Adrian texted Fran telling him that she was coming over. We know that Adrian was in her bedroom in her apartment at 4.43 a.m. when she sent this text because her roommates, Shani and Rebecca, put her there in their statements to the police. This is further corroborated by several of the people who attended the party at the young women's apartment. It was likely just before or just after Adrian sent the text to Fran that she called Scottsdale Cab Guy for a ride to Fran's house. Now, Tom Simon Sr., who owned the cab company, took the initial call that Adrian made to request the cab. He claims that Adrian told him that she wanted to be picked up at the AMPM on the corner of University Drive and Hardy Drive, which is roughly a quarter mile from Adrian's apartment, which is also on Hardy Drive, just in between Fifth and Brown. One of the first questions that arises when looking over this information is, why would Adrian have the cab meet her a quarter mile down the street from her apartment complex? Why not have the cab pick her up from her apartment? It's almost 5 a.m. on a Saturday. 
why walk alone down the street to a gas station? Sure, an AMPM is easier to spot than a specific apartment complex, especially considering that Adrian's apartment complex is one of many in the area on the same street. But these complexes have specific addresses, and it's part of a cab driver's job to find these addresses. This is part of what Adrian is going to pay them for. So there was likely a little more to her reasoning for wanting to meet the cab away from her apartment, I think. Could it be because Adrian was embarrassed that she had just wrecked her car and rendered it undrivable because she attempted to drive drunk? If her roommates said to her, why is a cab here to pick you up, Adrian? Where's your car? Well, she'll have to answer them and say, well, I was driving erratically when I left the first time and I ended up wrecking my car. So that might have been embarrassing for her. Of course, she could also simply tell her roommates that she called a cab precisely because she was too drunk to drive her own car. And I'm sure they would have been fine with that answer and probably pretty pleased with it, actually. But that wouldn't help Adrian to avoid the question of where her car is. In any event, Adrian leaves her apartment and starts walking down Hardy Drive from 5th Street toward University Drive, where the AMPM sits a quarter mile away. At 4.52 a.m., a surveillance camera at O'Reilly Auto Parts captures a woman who looks like she could be Adrian walking down Hardy Drive. Now, this O'Reilly Auto Parts is almost directly across from the AMPM on Hardy Drive. So, in other words, AMPM and O'Reilly Auto Parts are both on Hardy Drive and University Drive, but they're on opposite corners facing each other. Okay, so if the camera sees her, then she's right across the street from it. So if that was Adrian that the surveillance camera captured at 4.52 a.m., then she's all but arrived at the a.m.p.m. already. However, the cab driver who has been dispatched to the a.m.p.m. to meet Adrian, Tom Simon Jr., arrives at the a.m.p.m. at just about the same time that this young woman is captured on camera. Tom Simon Jr. calls Adrian on her cell phone at 4.53 a.m., just one minute after the camera spotted the young woman. Now, this call went through. Phone records from both Adrian and from Tom Simon Jr. show that the call went through and lasted for long enough for Simon to ask Adrian where she was and for her to tell him that she's almost there. But she doesn't get there. The woman in the camera footage moves beyond the camera's view while Tom Simon Jr. smokes a cigarette and waits for Adrian. When he tries to call Adrian again at 5.07 a.m., her phone is dead. That was 14 minutes after he last talked to her, and she told him that she was almost there. Is it suspicious, then, that Simon Jr. waited for almost 15 minutes to call her again after she told him that she was almost there? Even if Adrian had still been at her apartment at 4.53 a.m. when Tom Simon Jr. first called and spoke to her, she would have made it to the a.m. p.m. well before 5.07 a.m. It's a quarter mile walk. It takes the average pedestrian about five to seven minutes to walk a quarter mile. So if Adrian were still at her apartment when Tom Simon Jr. called her at 4.53 a.m., she would have been at a.m. p.m. by 5 a.m., a full seven minutes before Simon calls her again. Plus, on the 4.53 call, she told Tom Simon Jr., that she was even closer to AMPM than her apartment was, so she definitely would have arrived before 5.07 a.m. Still, maybe Tom Simon Jr. wanted to smoke two cigarettes, or maybe he just likes to give his customers a full 15 minutes to show up before he calls them again. I don't know. So after he calls Adrian and her phone is off, Tom Simon Jr. leaves the AMPM at 5.07 a.m., and Adrian Salinas is gone. Her trail goes cold and won't be picked up again until her dead body is discovered several weeks later. The search for suspects in most homicide and suspicious death investigations begins with victimology. Who, if anyone, might want Adrian Salinas dead. The first person of interest in Tempe Police Detective Alan Akey's investigation into Adrian's disappearance would obviously be Francesco Artiaga, 
Adrian's boyfriend, who Adrian had been arguing with on the night she went missing. Fran and Adrian were together at Adrian's Friday night party on June 14th. At the party, Adrian became annoyed with Fran for flirting with some of the other women at the party, and this led to a fight between the couple. As Friday night neared Saturday morning, Fran decided to go home to his house in Scottsdale to get away from Adrian and her accusations. Adrian was able to apologize to Fran and get him to calm down after he had threatened to leave the party, but Fran told her that he still intended to leave, so Adrian decided to go with him. The couple left together in Fran's car, but their fighting started up again. Eventually, Adrian decided that she no longer wanted to go to Fran's house and demanded that he take her back to the party. Fran agreed, but they were in a busy area of a college town in Tempe. It was now 2 a.m. on Saturday, and all of the bars and nightclubs were just getting out. There was a lot of traffic for Fran to contend with, and eventually, Adrian grew too impatient and annoyed with Fran to stay in his car any longer. She told him that she would walk the rest of the way back to her apartment and hopped out of Fran's car. Fran then called Adrian's roommates, Shani and Rebecca, to let them know that Adrian was walking and to keep an eye out for her. Of course, we know that Adrian did make it back to her apartment after getting out of Fran's car and walking the rest of the way. After returning to her party for a while, she began to feel guilty about her fight with Fran and decided that she did want to go and be with him at his house after all. This is what caused Adrian to try to drive her own car to Fran's house. In the meantime, after Adrian had left his car, Francisco Arteaga went home to his house and subsequently went to sleep. At least, this is what Fran told investigator Alan Aki. He's been cooperative, and he's... Uh, the way I've described Fran is if I called him right now and said, Hey, I'm working the case. I need you to show up. I, I need you to do A, B, and Z. He would come in and do A, B, and Z without hesitation. Whether Fran missed Adrian's 11 calls and one text message because he was asleep, or whether he missed them because he was still angry with Adrian, it does appear to be true that the last time Francisco Arteaga ever saw his high school sweetheart was when she jumped out of his car that morning in anger. The next logical persons of interest in Detective Aki's investigation were the Simons. Both Tom Simon Jr., who was driving the cab that was dispatched to meet Adrian at the AMPM, and Tom Simon Sr., who took Adrian's initial call, were on Detective Aki's radar as potential sources of information. Both men had cooperated with police and had given detailed statements early on in the investigation. They both explained that they took Adrian's call as a routine fare, that Tom Simon Jr. showed up at the AMPM to meet Adrian, but she never showed and he left. End of story. However, as the investigation moved along, Tom Simon Jr. began to look more and more like a suspect. Reports suggested to Detective Aki that Tom Simon Jr. had a murky past. Clients and customers had reported strange behavior from Simon Jr. during their cab rides. One woman in particular claimed that when Tom Simon Jr. had once driven her to Sedona, Arizona, he had pulled over to look through his trunk. After rummaging through the trunk for a bit, Simon Jr. pulled out a hacksaw and wondered aloud about how it possibly could have gotten there. Was it Tom Simon Jr.'s hacksaw, and he was pretending it wasn't? Did it belong to Tom Simon Sr., and he had placed it in Tom Jr.'s trunk without telling him? Why did Tom Simon Jr. pull over to rummage through his trunk in the middle of a fair? A woman who lived next door to Tom Simon Jr. reported to police that on Sunday, June 16th, the Father's Day when Rick Salinas reported his daughter missing, she heard muffled screams coming from Simon Jr.'s apartment. As the woman began to pay closer attention, she believed that she heard a young woman calling out for help, only for the young woman's cries to be cut off abruptly. Tempe police put Tom Simon Jr. under surveillance. The police report from the surveillance claims that Tom Simon Jr. spotted police following him and began, quote, making heat runs, end quote. Heat runs apparently are police lingo for trying to determine if one is being tailed or trying to shake a tail by making erratic turns or abrupt turns, driving into strange areas where it's difficult to be followed, etc. So eventually, Tom Simon Jr. evaded the police, his heat runs proving to be successful in shaking the tail. And so Detective Aki went to his house. There we go. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? Can we... Just knock that out, I can give you a ride. I don't want to do it, man. Why is that? Why wouldn't you want to 
Because I don't trust those things. I don't know. The lawyer said not to. What I'm, lawyer? I personally don't care. I just the well, lawyer, I think the lawyer said not to because and not to talk to you guys anymore. And not to talk to us. Yeah, because you're, you're really hassling me at this point. No. I, you know, I was a hard worker. A lady called me. I went there. She wasn't there. End of story. If you guys don't believe it, go get a warrant. Take me to jail. Detective Alan Aiky did just that. He went to a judge and got a warrant to bring Tom Simon Jr. into custody. First, first we're going to de-escalate everything. Everything is de-escalated, but you got to. And naked, then we're going to let you pull get the dressed. guy out and embarrass him in front of these neighbors. Then we're no going to let you get How dressed. are you guys going to fix that after this? Okay. Then How are you going to fix my dressed. life after this? You guys are treating me like a criminal, and I'm absolutely wrong. not. You are too. Absolutely not. Can you please stay in here? What's going on? Man, you guys are treating me like shit, dude. All I do is drive a taxi, and you guys are, have put handcuffs on me. You've taken me from my house. This isn't right, man. We're just executing an Why order. Why did you let him do this to me? We're just executing an order. You guys know darn well. You guys even said that you saw it on the tape that I was there and the girl wasn't there. Why are you doing this? To satisfy the family? To... to, to to check every avenue? You know what I am. You know I'm a taxi driver who does his job every night. After more questioning, Simon Jr. surrendered a DNA sample to the authorities. Okay, we're going to obtain buckle, uh, uh, buckle swabs from you. What the hell is buckle swabs? And basically, we're going to take a DNA sample from you, from your mouth. Why do you have to do that? Because we have an order to do that. Okay? I didn't I'm give you permission. I didn't give you his permission. Direction. Can you open your mouth to off? That's a violation. How is that a violation? He just stuck something in my fucking mouth well, and took to something explain. that belongs to me. I it doesn't matter. That's not me. right. Especially from someone who got a phone call and went to try and pick up a girl that called me, and then when I got there, she's not there. And you guys put some shit in my mouth? You guys are fucking disgusting creatures. It's a sterile future. Shut up. I'm now going to give you back. Whatever. I hate what? you, man. Give me give my your cash money. back. Your belt buckle. Your 10 cents. And your... You're a disgusting human being. So is your fucking judge. There's a copy of this well, at your residence. Uh, but I'm going to give you this copy I don't as well, care. Just in case I don't want to hear anything else from you. You're a liar and you fucking steal. You stole my fucking DNA. And he was released. Detective Alan Aiky claims that there are still some unanswered questions that he has for Tom Simon Jr. He can be a big help in the case with, because he was the last person that we know to have contact with her. So when I say I have some unanswered questions, I mean, just having a conversation with him, hey, do you recall this, or can we work, you know, talk more about that? It could be just as that simple, like using his recollection to advance the case. Simon Jr. claims that he has answered every question the police have asked. What have they asked that we haven't answered? Nothing. And with no new evidence to link him to Adrian's death, no DNA recovered from her body to match his DNA samples, Tom Simon Jr. simply wants to be left alone. Tom Simon Sr., answered Adrian Salinas's call on the early morning of Saturday, June 15th, and sent his son to pick her up at the a.m. p.m. As far as the police investigation has been able to determine, that's all he did. Tom Simon Sr. has his own theory about what might have happened to Adrian. Other cabs swing in and pick people up. It's very common with the competitive nature of this business for somebody to uh, swing right by or scoop right by and say to them, uh, you called a cab? and the person then thinks that that was their cab driver. That's important because uh, one of the possibilities, that, as we see it, is that uh, Tom got scooped on this uh, particular ride. Any of us, including the, the cab company that can help with that, uh, we want to do that, even though it might be uncomfortable. It's possible Tom Simon Sr.'s theory about another cab company taking Adrian is accurate, but no other cabs appeared on any of the aforementioned surveillance footage from the night Adrian went missing. Plus. 
Tom Simon Jr. spoke to Adrian while he was waiting at the AM PM, so a rogue cab couldn't have picked her up from under Simon Jr.'s nose without him seeing it. And if another cab had picked her up while she was walking down Hardy, it's likely that the camera at O'Reilly Auto Parts would have seen it. Both Tom Simon Jr. and Sr. live out of state. They were never arrested or charged. Tempe police said they have never been declared suspects of any kind. If the likeliest suspects in the disappearance of Adrian Salinas seem to be cleared of any wrongdoing, who else could have been involved? Earlier I read from the medical examiner's report on Adrian's autopsy, and I mentioned that one line had been redacted. I'll read the report again now. Quote, the remains are mostly skeletonized, with mummified skin and muscle, present more on the right side of the body as compared to the left side of the body. Some head hair is present on the upper neck. Pink nail polish is present on the toenails. End quote. Do any of the lines that I read there sound sort of funny to you? The sentence that says, some head hair is present on the upper neck? That's a strange sentence, no? Could this mean that Adrian's head was missing? Is it possible that the redacted sentence from the report says something like, the head is missing? Tempe police won't comment on whether or not the entirety of Adrian's body was recovered. It remains unclear as to why they won't say. With the corpse being out in the desert, possibly for a long time, one might expect some animal activity interfering with the body. However, if the medical examiner observed animal activity and thought that it might have played a role in any missing parts of the body, it's likely it would have been included in the report. And would a sentence about animal activity be redacted? Again, if most of the potential suspects who were close to Adrian's circle of victimology have been cleared, who else could have been involved? Is it possible that Adrian fell victim to a random attacker? A possible repeat offender? Were there any serial murderers in the area? Any killers whose M.O. happened to be decapitating young women? Well, actually, yes. There was. And this killer happened to be at a party in Tempe on the night of Friday, June 14th and the morning of Saturday, June 15th. A house party on Hardy Drive. Next time on Dark Dark World. It was as brutal as it was perplexing. Two young women, 22-year-old Angela Brasso and 17-year-old Melanie Burness, found dead, their bodies mutilated. We'll take a look at a possible serial killer known to decapitate the young women he killed. We know there are reports that the victim's hands may have been missing or her head may have been missing. We'll look at his story and find out that he was at a party on Hardy Drive on the night that Adrian disappeared. Somebody had mentioned the name Adrian Salinas in the crowd, whispering. They were all huddled together, you know. Was she targeted by someone who was at that party? Or was she just a random victim of opportunity by some unknown suspect who may not have ever committed a crime like that before? We'll try to determine whether or not he was the last person to see Adrian Salinas alive. He's under investigation for this case, yes. And that's it for this week, ladies and gentlemen. I've got a lot of content coming down the pike for you. The conclusion to this episode, of course. We've got some Dark Dark Room episodes and some more true crime in the time of quarantine. Uh, I hope you're all staying sane amid this quarantine. I know a lot of people are hurting. Um, I want to give a shout out to all of our patrons. I know times are tough and we have lost a couple of patrons. So for those of you that have been able to stick around and support us, I just want to say that it really does mean a lot, and I'm truly grateful for your help. These aren't easy times, so it's meaningful to see that what we're doing over here means enough to you that you're continuing to support it. Thank you. And if you're new to the show and you don't know what I'm talking about, please go check us out at Patreon. That's patreon.com slash darkdarkworld. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash darkdarkworld. 
And you can get more info about that if you just keep listening past this theme music that's creeping into your ears right now. It's all explained in a little blurb that plays after the music here. Thanks for listening, ladies and gentlemen. I've been Jordan Crittenden. See ya! Dark Dark World is a bi-weekly true crime podcast available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, iHeartRadio, and just about everywhere else you can find podcasts. You can visit us on our website at www.darkdarkworld.com. There you will find our online store for various merch items, as well as all of our contact info including social media profiles and a link to join our closed Facebook group, Dark Dark World Presents The Dark Dark Corner. You can gain access to ad-free episodes by supporting us on Patreon for as little as $2 per month. There, in addition to ad-free versions of all of our episodes, you'll have access to bonus episodes, blooper reels, video, and a discount for our merch store. So check us out over there at patreon.com slash dark dark world that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash dark dark world if you're enjoying the show please tell your friends and family about it and consider leaving us a five-star review on apple podcasts it's really beneficial to the show and it goes a long way i've been jordan crittenden thank you for listening Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. If you would like your show featured, reach out to us at Indie Drop-In on all social media or go to IndieDropIn.com. See you next time.